What's growing on gardeners? It's Wednesday, August 16th, and I'm going to share with you on today's video the biggest piece of gardening advice that I have learned in the six years that I have lived here on the southeastern coast of North Carolina. What I learned this year will forever change the way that I garden, and it has proven to me that up until this point, I've been growing things completely wrong because I've been thinking wrong about how insects and diseases affect your garden. What I've done has changed the way I will grow things forever, and I really hope that you listen to what I'm saying in this video because it's taken all 37 years of my life to learn this fact. If you're new to the channel, please subscribe and hit the bell to receive new video notifications and check out our Amazon store and Spreadshop links in the video description for everything I use in my garden and awesome custom designed apparel and other gear. Your support is greatly appreciated. Some things you can learn via knowledge, which is studying and reading and researching. Other things you have to gain through wisdom, which is primarily gained through actual experience. And what I experienced this year will forever change the way that I think about gardening. Here on the southeastern coast of North Carolina, we have extreme problems with insect pests and with disease pressure. And I always thought that death of the plants from these things were going to be inevitable just because of our environment. But what I learned this year has blown me away. In order for a plant to become diseased, you need three different things. The first thing is a plant that is susceptible to disease. The second thing is a pathogen in your environment that the plant is susceptible to. And the third thing is enough of a pathogen to overwhelm the natural defenses of that plant. It is when that plant's natural defenses become overwhelmed by the pathogen that disease actually sets in. Let me give you a real world scenario. The most popular vegetable grown in the United States is the tomato plant. Now tomato plants are grown in all 50 states with some degree of success. Now tomato plants are highly susceptible to disease and in every single state in the United States, there are pathogens in the air that can affect that tomato plant. So no matter where you grow a tomato in the United States, you run the risk of disease. But how come some climates have a lot of trouble with tomato diseases where others don't? Well, that's because in northern climates, generally speaking, the conditions are such that the disease pressure only exists for a narrow window of time because the heat and humidity is not persistent enough, long enough, to colonize enough of a disease to overwhelm a plant's natural defense system. So therefore, if you live in one of those environments, your tomato plants probably aren't going to succumb to disease because they naturally stay resistant enough to the concentrations of disease in the air or the soil. Contrast that to where I live in the southeast or other portions of the south where it is hot and humid for a very long period of time and that colonizes an overwhelming amount of pathogens. Because of that, it's only a matter of time until the plant's natural defenses break down enough and the disease takes hold and strangles the life out of that plant. If you ask any gardener in the south, they will tell you that it is inevitable until their tomato plants succumb to disease, right? At least that's what I thought. Here you see the original tomato plants that I planted in my garden out in the open in full sun back in March, late March. And as you can see, they are all dead or dying. These plants are basically worthless to me. They are never going to recover. Look at my dwarf tomato project beds. They are much more susceptible to disease. And as you can see, they are dead as a doornail. And if you ask pretty much any grower in Alabama, Florida, Louisiana, the Carolinas, Georgia, they'll tell you this is probably what their tomato plants look like every single August if they're still in the ground at all. So because of where I live, I always assume that diseases like this are just inevitable and I follow the same planting schedule. I get them out as early as possible in early spring. That way I can try to beat the heat and harvest as much of a crop as possible before it gets really hot and humid and wet and the diseases set in. And then come May, I'll start spraying fungicides on my plants to try and delay the time period when the plants are eventually going to contract disease because their death is inevitable. I'm just hoping to extend that harvest another month or so to try and maximize the amount of tomatoes and other fruits I get off my disease susceptible plants. That is always what I've done up to this point because that's what everybody else does and I thought that's what you have to do. But you know what? I was wrong about that because I did something radically different this year and I tried to change my environment instead of just trying to deal with nature itself and try and make the tomato plant adapt to the conditions that they weren't evolved to adapt to. And I want to show you exactly what I'm talking about. 
about. This tomato plant right here is a big beef tomato plant, and it has grown so big and so vigorous, I'm literally using the roof of my sunroom as a trellis to try and hold it up. And I've never been able to grow an indeterminate beefsteak tomato plant this far into the season. I've never been able to grow any tomato plant this far into the season here because of our pest and disease pressure. And the incredible thing about this plant is I broke all the rules with this tomato plant. It has never been sprayed once, either by an insecticide or by a fungicide. I let this grow completely naturally and sprayless. And while I do have a few signs of early blight that are down here on the lowest tomato leaves, and I did have to remove a couple of the tomato leaves down there at the very bottom of the stem, overwhelmingly this tomato plant is healthy and the upper leaves are completely disease free and the craziest thing about this is i just picked these two tomatoes off this plant right here they are absolutely beautiful and it is still setting fruit i'm having tomatoes set here it just set a whole big cluster of tomatoes right here now it has been 95, 96 degrees every single day and our low temperatures have been in the 80s every single night. And I have been telling you up until this point that it is impossible for beefsteak tomatoes to pollinate in, this con in these conditions because the pollen gets sticky and it's just not going to form any fruit. Well, how come this tomato is proving me wrong? How am I growing a sprayless tomato that is getting no insect pests, very little disease, and still setting fruit in the absolute worst, most miserable conditions of the entire summer, whereas everything else out in the open is dead. Remember when I told you earlier in this video that you need three things for diseases to take hold onto a plant? Well, you can't change the fact that a plant is disease susceptible, and you can't change the fact that your environment colonizes pathogens. What you can change is the natural defenses of the plant themselves. You can modify the defenses of that plant to make them stronger so they naturally resist disease and they don't succumb, or at the very least, they can dramatically outlast when they otherwise would come down with some type of sickness. I learned this for 100% certainty this year by growing my main crop of tomatoes underneath that shade tunnel right there. Once early June rolled around and the sun got hot and strong, I put up that shade tunnel and I was absolutely blown away by the results underneath. All of my tomato plants underneath were performing fabulous. They had incredible pollination, incredible fruit set. They were disease free. They had no insect pests, whereas the tomatoes out in my open garden were just just dying. They were getting all kinds of diseases. They were being overwhelmed by pests. So what happened? Why was that environment so much more conducive to a healthy crop than out in the open where they were getting a lot more sun? Isn't more sun better? Well, what happened finally hit me like a freight train. What was going on all the other years of my life was, here in the southeast, the sun is so strong that it beats down on the tomato plants, and it causes so much stress that it not only requires a whole lot more nutrients out of the plant, but it breaks them down. All that heat stress just weakens the plant to a point where their natural defenses break down and they let in all of those diseases. They can no longer fight back against the high level of disease pressure in the air. And then once the plants start to get diseased, the insects can detect the hormones of a stressed out plant. And they come flooding in like crazy to attack the host that is weak because at the end of the day, they're basically scavengers and parasites. So if you can keep your tomatoes nice and cool and you can keep the moisture level even by keeping the hot sun off of them, it keeps the tomatoes defenses nice and strong. So they are able to naturally fight off the natural disease pressure in the air. And because they don't get weakened from disease, the pests don't, uh, don't notice that they're weak. They don't get that hormonal signal, so they don't come out and they don't ravage your plants. And look, I don't wanna make this whole video about tomato plants. This is about any fruit tree, any vegetable that is susceptible to disease. It is at its core a stress reaction. There is some type of environmental problem that is breaking down the natural defenses of that plant. And that is when the pathogens find the way to work their way in and exploit that weakness in in the plant's armor. And then that is when the pests come in because they get that signal that the plant's natural defenses are breaking down. And I got a hint about this with my fig trees last year that I acted on that is also proving true. 
Just like my tomato plants, I always had issues with fig rust disease on my figs come the middle of summer. And I always thought that's just because I lived in a hot, humid climate. And what you can see here is, you can see all of these plants succumbing to fig rust. You'll see that they are dropping leaves all over the place. Their leaves are turning yellow. They are overall not looking very good. However, the damage is relegated to only these four plants. All of my other figs look great. How can that be? Well, the reason why that happened is because all four fig trees right there dried out on me. They get contact from the sun. This is where the warm afternoon sun hits, and it hit those four containers and dried them out more than any other of the fig trees. So if you actually go inside the shade tunnel, you will see there is not a hint of rust on any of those fig trees other than these four that are dropping leaves. That's because any of these fig uh, trees are completely protected by the shade cloth, and all of those fig trees back there are planted in larger pots. I up-potted all of these into larger 15-gallon pots, so they have a much larger water reservoir, so that's why all of these figs are 100% rust-free. Meanwhile, I put some, uh, these are in smaller containers, but I had some of these, uh, these plant saucers underneath them. Well, none of these trees had an up-potting or the plant saucers, and they were beating in the sun. So as a result, they got dried out, and as soon as they underwent that stress reaction, simply letting them dry out once made it so the pathogens could work their way in, and they all came down with fig rust. Meanwhile, none of the other figs look like that. This is something that I learned last year with all of my in-ground fig trees. They would always get really bad rust. And what I realized was the reason why they were getting rust is because they were drying out when we would get hot, dry spells where we would, we would have four or five days of persistent high pressure with no thunderstorms. See, the problem is that most people think that figs are drought-tolerant plants because they come from the Mediterranean where it doesn't rain all summer. Well, actually, that's not 100% true. In their native climate in the Mediterranean, the figs grow on lime limestone rich soil and all of that limestone in the soil it creates moisture pockets where it stays wet even through the rainless summers and figs have evolved this spider-like root system that has learned how to infiltrate all of those limestone pockets so even though it doesn't rain for months in the Mediterranean on end they are able to exploit those moisture pockets because of the way that the fig roots have evolved to tap into those little water pockets in the stone so while figs may be very tolerant to drought in their native habitat growing in their native soil they are not here in the southeast where we are growing mostly on beach sand this was confusing me so badly because i was getting the rust after hot dry periods i always thought why am i getting rust when it's hot and dry it's less humid shouldn't there be less pathogens why do the fig trees do well when it's cool and wet shouldn't that be when fungal infections would take over well what i figured out was our native soil is so sandy and it drains so well and there's no rock in it, so there's nothing to hold on to moisture, even though I mulch very well. And these figs just have a high demand for water, so when we would go three to five days where it's 95 degrees and rainless, my sand soil would dry out, and that would weaken the figs and make them susceptible to fig rust. Well, this year, I didn't let that happen. This year, any time we had three or four days with no rain, I would take a hose and I would let it run at the bottom of each fig tree for a minute. And you know what? It was a little bit of extra work, but it worked. And as you can see, there are no signs of fig rust on any of these leaves, and we're officially entering the second half of August. I've never had completely disease-free in-ground fig trees like that. It turns out it was just an irrigation issue that the drought stress was weakening the fig trees and that is what was allowing the rust to take over. You don't have to spray them with any kind of fungicides. You just have to modify your environment so they never come down under stress. And just look at the production on these fig trees. Look how beautiful they look. They're a little bit behind because we had such a cool spring, but you know what? It's going to be a great fig season come September. So the moral of the story is this, if you are growing any kind of fruits or vegetables that are at all susceptible to pests and disease, do everything you can to keep the stress levels as low as possible on all those plants, especially during the heat of the summer. And the way you're going to do that is you're going to protect as much as
as possible with shade cloth. I'll make sure to link to that awesome 40% shade cloth I use down in the video description. You want to keep the plants as well fed as possible. Giving them fertilizer and keeping them nice and green and the, the stalks nice and thick and healthy will do a lot to keep their natural defenses high. Remember, plants grow faster in the summer and there's more stressors because of the strong UV index and the heat and humidity, so they actually need more food to stay healthy during the summer. So don't starve your plants. Also, make sure you mulch everything really well and run drip irrigation if you can so things don't dry out. I'll make sure to also link to the fertilizers I use and all my tutorials on how to build drip irrigation down in the video description. If you keep your plants as low stress as possible, they'll keep those natural defenses high so they will be less likely to succumb to anything. Now look, if you live in a challenging climate like I do, no matter what you do, the plants may eventually come down with some amount of pest and disease pressure. There's nothing you can do to keep off every tomato hornworm and every single coddling moth and every spider mite. There's nothing you can do to prevent some amount of blight. So maybe at some point in the year, you will have to spray some type of fungicide or insecticide to control things. Nothing is 100%, okay? But what I'm telling you is, if you keep the plants as low stress as possible, you can minimize the amount of damage caused by that. And on that note, I want to take you inside my shade tunnel because what I want to show you in there is actually pretty shocking. So we are midway through August and the tomatoes in here have finally given up the ghost. They are dying back. But it's not for the reason that you think. It's not because they succumb to pests and diseases. It's actually because the straw bales that I planted them in, well, it's so hot, humid, and wet here that they decomposed at such an incredibly fast rate that there's basically nothing left. And my plants have run out of growing medium. It shrunk so much that it's exposed the roots and it's just caused the plants to die back. So that is why they're wilting and failing. It's not because of environmental conditions, it's because the straw has given up on me. So here where I live, my growing season is so long and it is so wet and humid that the decomposition rate, uh, the straw bales just don't last all season. Uh, the plants that I planted the latest, like this cucumber here, is still doing okay because there's enough straw bale left. And I am getting some uh, pretty decent production here. But what's uh, surprising to me is uh, it's making me rethink if I'm going to do straw bales on all my plants next year because now that I know that uh, they don't last long enough for my climate, I'm thinking about using grow bags. But the problem with that is uh, the grow bags, then I can't reuse the soil every single year. So uh, it'll be a challenge, but I'm really going to think about how I'm going to grow these under shade next year and try to get the best out of both worlds. It's, it's always an interesting learning experience when you're a gardener. You are never done learning. As a point of reference, here are the straw bales that I'm going to put my fall tomatoes in. This is how big they used to be when they were in perfect shape. Now, your fall tomatoes are not going to live as long. It's a much shorter season, so the straw bales will be great for that, especially in the cooler weather. But a side-by-side -side comparison showing what a new straw bale looks like compared to what they look like now underneath my shade tunnel is pretty dramatic. So I know this was a bit of a more rambling, stream of consciousness type of video, but I really needed to get this information out to you because a lot of the things that I've believed my entire life technically isn't true. Conventional wisdom only holds things up when you do things conventionally. If you change the environment that you're growing in, like I did with that shade cloth, well now conventional wisdom no longer holds up because it's like I'm growing in a completely different location. I, I took the hard sun and all of that stress it induces out of the equation. So if you're willing to change the amount of stress that your plants undergo, suddenly they can do things where you live that you never thought was possible. And that's what I'm seeing right here. When you honestly assess a situation and you, you start thinking, in the way of what am I doing wrong or what can I do to change my environment so I no longer have to deal with all these conditions that I deal with? Well, if you're willing to have that honest conversation and try new things, you can strike gold. I mean, it's really no different than what I do with my citrus and avocado trees right here. I was told that I couldn't grow citrus and avocados in ground in North Carolina. Well, through my fancy protection methods and my microclimate methods, I was able to take the cold out of the equation. Well, now when it comes to my challenging summer vegetables like tomatoes, cucumbers, and squash, I took the heat out of the equation, and now I'm having better results than I've ever had. So everybody, I sure hope you found this video helpful. If you did, please make sure to hit that like button, subscribe to the channel, and please ring 
ring that notification bell so you're notified when I release more videos like these. If you're curious about any of the products that I mentioned in this video, I will provide direct links to all of them down in the video description. And for everything else I use in real life in my garden, they are all linked down below on my Amazon storefront. And while you're there, check out my spread shop for custom merch if you want to support the channel. Thank you all so much for watching. I hope this video was helpful and I hope to see all of you again on the next video. Dale is going for a car ride today and Dale gets terrible motion sickness so we give him this Serenia and that stops his motion sickness and I found that the perfect pill pocket is a dried fig with a little bit of peanut butter in it. The gooiness of the dried fig, it completely masks that, that pill feeling. So here you go, sweetheart. Ooh, isn't that good, buddy? That's a fig stuff with peanut butter. I even love them. Oh, and look at that. Dale ate his pill like a champ. Now in 90 minutes, he'll be good to go for his car ride.